So in this episode, we're going to be focusing or exploring how power dynamics, medicalization, disempowering women during childbirth can result in traumatic experiences where women may feel like they have little control over their bodies and the birth process. And with me here today is my friend, my sister, Rhoda Asio. Um, you'll introduce yourself a bit later. And the reason why she's here with me today is we're going to discuss how her birth process and how, you know, went for her and what that looks like with, you know, with regard to what we call respectful maternity. Um, welcome, Rhoda. Thank you. Um, so maybe we start with introducing yourself and, you know, what you do and how you came to be here. My name is Rhoda Asio. Mm. I'm a chef. Um, I think that's what I identify myself as most of the time. Now newly mother. And uh, yeah, I'm here because you invited me to come <laughs> here to talk to you. <laughs> wow. <Well, laughs> to come and share my, my birth experience because it might be, some women might relate with me. Some might um, not feel alone and, you know, Mm, maybe maybe understand. Like, yeah, I've, I've yeah. gone through that, and I'm yeah. like, it's fine and everything. So, so wait. First, before you go into that, mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe I can, I can, I can say the reason why I asked you to come here. Okay. Yeah. Let Let's start from there. Mm-hmm. So, Rhoda is my sister-in-law. Um, she recently had her baby, and we basically, <laughs> I was there for the birth, and I say this to everyone that I talk to uh, actually my my friends that for me that birth was very traumatic mainly because it was the first time I'd actually witnessed a birth I have two kids but this is the first time you actually saw I it actually yourself. saw it for myself and I and I after that I left and I said <laughs> to my husband wow if 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 this had happened before you had our second child we'd still be having a first child because I for me it was very traumatic but I want to hear it from you. Like, how do you feel like from the get go, conceiving, being pregnant, and then actually giving birth to the child? What do you feel that process went like for you? And feel free to talk about the hospital visits and all that stuff. But like, we just want to hear from you because when we talk about birth trauma, it's it's more than just how you are handled in the mm. hospital. Mm. It's more about was it a bit respectful? Did they hear what you wanted? Did you, you know, did you receive the care that you you thought you were going to get and other things? Mm. Mm. Start, Start from I conceived. <laughs> How was your journey? <laughs> the month of conception was actually, that was one of my happiest months that year. Mm. I mean, I went and got tattoos. Mm. I was all over the place. I had so much joy. I mm. think that's why Fatih has so much joy, actually. Mm. I had so much joy. And then one day I'm trying to finish a beer and it's not going down. Mm. And I thought, okay, yeah, what's going on? Yeah. Then I obviously missed my period. Seven days later and I'm thinking, ah, it can be because I'm on birth control yeah. anyway. Yeah. I've been taking my pills on time. I've been doing everything as I should. I had the alarms that rang at 8 p.m. And here I am. So I said, okay, let me just go and take a pregnancy test. I mean... How many times have women taken pregnancy tests? Mm-hmm. I think over a hundred times. So when I went to, to take it, I remember waiting for the, the times, just two minutes for to see the results. And I was like, I'm sure this is going to be negative. So I'm seeing, I turn around and I see two lines. And I'm like, mm, no, this is, not, this, this is not happening. So I went to get, I was a general math thinker by the way. Mm-hmm. I went to get that good life and I got another test. And I went to pee again. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. Said, no, maybe, maybe this is just faulty. So I'll take time, give it <laughs> another week, test. <laughs> and then do another test. Those lines were so strong. Mm. I think I've never <laughs> seen such distinct two to lines. Clear like lines there immediately. Immediately, you thought even nothing was faint. So I went to the doctor, my gynecologist at that time, and I took, and I did that whole blood test, whatever. Mm. Mm. He's like, unfortunately, I'll have to tell you congratulations. Unfortunately? Because <laughs> he's like, I don't know if you're prepared. Yeah, I yeah. can't tell anything. And I said, I... No. It took some time to actually sink in. Mm. And I realized I'm pregnant. 
Mm. So I'm thinking, now what am I going to tell my mom? You know, I felt like I'm a teenager, mm. like I'm still mm. 17. Me, I'm a teen mom, actually. <laughs> You're, <laughs> You're not. A teen mom. <laughs> You're not. So I'm, I'm thinking, hey, what will my mom say? Mm. And then weirdly that week she calls me and she says, maybe I had a dream you, you had a big family. It was like, this thing is mothers and the yeah. instincts. Yeah. It's, it's a bit too uncanny. So it's now telling the father of the mm. kids was, that was the biggest, I don't know why it becomes such a, a hard thing to do. And you imagine so many scenarios in your head, like, can be a single mother, yeah. and we're going to do this together. It's at some point I even thought maybe I can just run away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start, start a family elsewhere by myself mm. with a kid. I mean, so many things are running through my mind. Just to imagine me, this teen mom, raising a whole kid. And I felt like at that time my career had just started getting a good trajectory. Mm. And bam. Yeah. So yeah, that was my conception period. Throughout the pregnancy, I would say it had so many ups and downs because first and foremost, the support I got from my families, both sides, mm. was so phenomenal mm. because that's when I felt, wow, I actually have a community behind mm. me. Mm. And I can imagine how many how many women don't have that to say. So they don't have their partners. They don't have families behind. Mm. I mean, it's, it's shocking. And even what I hear, people who have very supportive partners still feel alone. Yeah. And you can't invalidate anyone's feelings during pregnancy because you don't know what's going on. So the whole the whole journey, I'd say, had very high highs and very low, low lows. lows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But up until um, I'd say by the time I was going to give birth, by then she took me. <laughs> When I was so, in labor. So, 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 so pause there. <laughs> Let me pick up the story for delivery. <laughs> And then you can tell it from your own because you okay. always ask me, was my birth that traumatic? Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> so uh, we, we we take Rhoda to the hospital and I think we left you there. Mm. Um, so I think it was like maybe 3 a.m. Yeah, was it was 2, 3 a.m. 2, 3 a.m. Mm. By the time we left at what, 6 maybe? Or I don't really remember. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> at some point... Six, seven, we left her in the hospital. Um, she was still walking around. She was fine. Um, laboring, but not actually laboring is how I remember it. Mm. And so we left. We go home, come back at six. I think it was six or four, whatever time it was, she was still laboring. So me in my mind, <laughs> I was like, guy, you're still laboring. <laughs> <laughs> and in my head, I was like, why is this delivery? Why is this? Why is this um, delivery taking so taking long? So long? Mm. But again, I come from a place of privilege where I didn't, I didn't have to labor so long. So mm. again, that's, that's me basing it on, your basing experience. It on my own mm. experience where everyone's experience is different. So I come back and I find Rhoda. The first thing that hits me was that how, how you were delivering in the same room I left you. Like, I was like, oh, Akuna delivery room. Sort of yes, delivery I was room. like, Akuna delivery room. And then people are just walking in and out. For me, that felt very, very unsafe. Like, it just felt... You know, I actually don't remember that part. <laughs> you don't remember anything. <laughs> I actually I don't... don't remember how many people walked in and out. <laughs> people are just walking, Hiya, badum, toto. Hiya, badum, toto. And I'm like, bro, give this babe some privacy. Like, honestly, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So, so to put it into context, how I think about delivery, and I might be old school, mm. is that you go to the hospital, you're told, he in your labor ward, he in your delivery room, and then he on the place, your ward, maluna, fakunda kulala, period. So I don't know, for me, that was new. That laboring, mm. delivering in one room, very American style, I had never seen. Do you know, actually, because uh, I'm a TikTok mother, <laughs> and a TikTok pregnant babe, <laughs> I was seeing, um, first of all, I've always had a fear of nurseries. This thing of mm. what happens to babies in the nurseries. I've always seen those videos. And I don't know why it's when you're about to experience something, that's when you start seeing the scary videos. Mm. So I was seeing this this video of a nurse who took a baby, had been crying, I think, for 30 minutes and just bashed him. And I was like, by the way, nurseries? <laughs> it's a no, no, none. And then there's a story of babies being swapped. Mm. And I was like, you can't even tell babies apart most of the time. Mm. 
So I said, one of the reasons I actually chose that hospital was because it was newly influenced, mm. <laughs> if I may say. <laughs> newly influenced. TikTok, TikTok mom. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I thought, yeah, I want to be in that room, deliver in that room. Yeah. And I'm not going anywhere. Mm. And I felt like the convenience of having a bathroom in mm. your delivery room, as opposed to sharing loos and, you know, you just gone through something through. So, I traumatic. don't know. Yeah, <laughs> traumatic, invasive, mm. it's so much. And I didn't want to have to share public amenities, if yeah. I may say it. So that's one of the reasons I chose the hospital. And by the time I was going there, that's when everyone is asking me, hey, unaza apa? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah exactly and so, i think that's 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 the that's the vision that i had because for me going through it two times mm. differently and you never having gone through it i don't think you you, you I had, I, expect- yeah, had, had an expectation had expectations yeah and i think even when we're having these conversations a hundred percent when you ask another mom how is childbirth they will not tell you exactly how it is because it's like somehow, some way, mm. my pain and yours won't be the same That's or true. I have forgotten that pain or whatever it is, I won't tell you. Mm. You will find someone saying, ah, Simba, you know, ama mtumia kwambe wa, it's the worst pain you've ever had. So yeah, when you start right. thinking about the worst pain I've ever had, you can't put you it can't into, imagine. you can't put it into words. So me, when I came and I found you there, honestly, that was the first my first point of reference was no. It's a no. This is no. Where's the privacy, mm. friend? Where are the... <laughs> no. Where are the doctors? Where are the people in scrubs? Me, by the way... No. And I think it also... What, what also I think influenced me is now my generation. Because we, we, we grew up seeing Kina Kardashians. Mm. Pulling out their yes. own babies <laughs> our from Nazalia. their own... Yeah, our Nazalia in, like, in, in those rooms where your family is there and yeah. everything. I mean, I didn't expect that many people <laughs> in that room. <laughs> because at some point, by the time there I was done, many. as I'm looking around, I'm like, all of you are here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even... I wasn't in that headspace to to realize. But I think it's that it's what we grew up seeing. Yeah. I think what we were exposed to and what we know. I mean, I never had any birth um, conversations with anyone per se until I was actually yeah, pregnant and yeah. people are giving me so Different many stories. stories. I'm at work and um, I don't know if I'll say fortunately or unfortunately, the people I work with don't have um, access to good medical health care. Mm. So the stories they tell me that like, and they're telling me, I'm like, no. Mm. <laughs> no. In my mind, I was like, I, I feel like a man right now where I'm just saying no to everything. And then when the baby came out, my my then concern moved from Rhoda to the baby. And it was so clear for me. It was like, what are we going to do with this baby? I did not think about you for one instant. I was just like, okay, that's done. So, and that was the clear distinction between the hospital and, and everyone else who was there. So the the lady, the midwife was very concerned about you. And she stuck there. I remember that. And she said, and I kept on asking, did you hear me asking, what about the baby? See, can you do something about the baby? Mm. And she was very, very clear to say, the mother comes first. We cannot lose the mother. She's losing a lot of blood. Let me finish this before we look after the baby. And that clicked something mm-hmm. inside me. I'm like, so as a, as a normal person, I, I'm not sure how to feel right now, you know. I hear what you're saying, but me, for me, I'm thinking the baby comes first. But so let me ask you, Mm. I I read this actually this week and I don't know if it was a tweet or what I saw, but the question would be if you are to choose one, your life is in danger. You are giving birth and you're telling your husband to choose one. What would you say? So the, the thing around the research, the research and the doctors, and that's why we had invited, uh, um, a medical doctor to join us today so that she can we can just hear a different view about mm. medicalization and the the thing that research always says and like all these papers that doctors write is that you have you save the mother's life okay. because the mother can you know can have other kids you have to save you have to pick one and it's not fair for you to ask that yes, on one person it's the doctor supposed to make that judgment and usually it's you have to save a mother's life you know, 
if you can save both, do both. But again, I'm not a medical expert, so it would have been nice to just hear from someone who mm. is a medical expert how they make those decisions, how they make that judgment call. Mm. But again, I'd say she was very, very clear in her intention. She didn't even start her. She didn't even say, she said, I have to do this, I have to finish and make sure she's fine. She's losing a lot of blood. So for me, that entire experience traumatized the hell out of me. I was just like, is this what birth looks like? Is this what birth feels like? It felt like I'd never had a child, honestly. Because if you ask me my experience... <laughs> I remember having I, your prayer. <laughs> I, was, I was just like, bro, is this done? You know, like you don't... Yeah. You feel the pain, you move on from the pain. Now the child is here. You f it's like that never happened. But I witnessed it for what it was. The smells, the... Um, the energy in the room, the people doing whatever they're doing, the child coming out of be Jesus. And I was like, ah, yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. I'm never going to do that again in my entire life for me, for anyone, for whatever. So I just want to hear that that was traumatic for me. And that's when I made that decision. Like, you know, mm. never going to have any more kids. I mean, I didn't. The, the birth I, I envisioned from the beginning is not what I wanted. I didn't want a, a, a hospital birth to begin what with. What did you want? I wanted a water bath. Mm -hmm. You know, again, influence. <laughs> <laughs> we, I saw, like, two years earlier, I don't remember how, how far away it was. Um, what's her name? Shikonguru. Mm -hmm. She had that. She's done it twice, actually, the she water bath. Twice. Yeah. Not once? There was a first one with her, her first boy. Mm. I saw in the, it in on, a sitting room. On no, no, no. Mm. I think it was at the center itself. Mm. The, the guys who provide the whole setup. Mm. There was that one, and then there's the, no, the, the one the that one she had at home. Room. Yeah, I saw that one, yeah. And she looked very calm. <laughs> <laughs> she looked quite she calm looked, for, uh, for what we expect a bath to be like. The screaming yes, and the whatever. Yes. Yeah. And then that's the time, now again on TikTok, I'm seeing all this um, choose the way you want to give birth. Um, the effects, the, the best way to give birth is water bath. Mm. Um, what it does for you, it's a calm environment for the baby. It's You you can you can give birth while squatted or whatever. Mm. You don't have to be on your back. You know, all those things. It gives you that freedom to be comfortable. Mm. And that's what I saw until one time when I, I reached out to those guys. I think they're called Eve's Mama, mm. something like that. And I saw the price of the package. And I was like, wow, a quarter million is not small money. Yeah. And it's not just accessible. And if you have insurance, as insurance, consider that something to be mm. covered. Of course, no, that, that looks like even something more risky to them, I think. Yeah. So they would not consider that. So now I had to go back to the drawing board and see, okay, what does my insurance cover? Mm. What um, what's my limit, and what can I, um, what where can I give birth? Mm. And you know, you hear all these crazy stories of hospitals, and you don't even know what to to choose. Yeah. So, how I ended up in my choice? Mm. It's, I don't know. So how 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 would you say it would have made your choice easier? What kind of information would you have needed and? packaged in what way because we're talking about tiktok right now mm. <laughs> talking about the tiktok generation as you've said what how what would have made it easier for you to access this information i mean we don't have uh, how do i say i think if more people spoke about what they've gone through mm. and not just for clout you know there's some people who just do these things out of getting views or whatever but actual experiences and i think that's what people use to to make their choices mm, majority of mm. the time. And um, I mean, it's Kenya, we're not, there's a lot of corruption going on. So you wouldn't be able to get the free um, actual information that you would need to help you make the choice. And I don't know how insurance um, insurance companies guide us to do such things. Mm. Do they just uh, help you choose the one that fits according to what they have to give the hospital? Because mm. I hear that's another issue. And you know, for like for me, by the time I was being discharged, my package was about 60K. Mm. And what my maternity was covering was about 200. But because of one small thing of the covering of a bed, mm. not being inclusive of that package, insurance said, by the way, we're not paying. Really? Yeah, I had to top up about 10 Gs or 15. So I found that so peculiar. Mm. And I thought, if it fits under what we're meant to pay, I mean, why not? Yeah. 
And I think uh, maternity is not well covered in insurance companies, especially for those who pay for themselves and not just um, as a benefit from the company you work for. Mm. I think it's so, so limiting what we get to actually choose from because now you're left with... I will look at, for example... Uh, can I mention names here? It's fine. Okay. We can look at um, Nairobi Hospital, for example. If your limit is 200K, what, for example, if the natural birth is about 100 and something, does it cover any extra thing that could happen? Do you, How much would you have to top up? I mean, we're not given that information first hand to help you choose what you need to... Yeah. Where you need to go. Yeah. Otherwise, you just end up choosing something and then you have an emergency and you're told something that's not in between the lines and you should look at it like... Ah, yeah. Now we have to start looking for this money. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I remember that that I I was telling you at the time was NHIF. I remember having the conversation about NHIF because, again, just freshly remembering that I just had the child. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the hospital was very keen on saying is that you should carry NHIF and be up to date with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that very strange because if insurance is covering why does a hospital also have to take, you know, something to give the mm. national um, health insurance fund? And that's the thing that also we are not very. So when you go for your doctor's visits, it's not something that's very clearly explained to you what to expect mm. at the end of the delivery, because you are expected to come to the hospital. Yes. But at the same time, most of these hospitals require you to come with with a pre-authorized form yes. or something like that so book. that they can or book the you know but three or four months ahead. Me, like, so what happens if I want to if I need to give birth if it came and I haven't booked mm. so that means you'll will you shut me out what would that's the question I was wondering like why do we have a system like that mm. and it's it's important to know I mean like it's why do we need to go with a pre-authorization form from the insurance when you know nine months later I'm going to have a child so you might as well once I tell you I'm pregnant, you should give me a pre-authorization pre mm. form knowing that the child is going to come in, or at least three months before, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. So that you don't have to go and wait um, to be admitted into a hospital. Mm. So that's the thing that I always kept on wondering, you know, some of these things. But then I had another question around the care mm -hmm. that you received from the time you, you came into the hospital. Mm -hmm. When we talk about care, it's just basically respect for the birth plan that you had. So it might not have been a water bath, but you had a thought, you had some, a, sort, of idea. some sort of idea of what you wanted. And then also how they treated you, how they talked to you, talking about consent. We were talking about consent earlier in terms of, you know, inserting... Yes. Oh, my days. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to ask for consent. When you're asking, when you're doing that service check and, you know, it can't be... It shouldn't be different people who just walk around and come mm -hmm. and do that. So let's talk about care. How did you feel about that? Uh, starting from the point that we got into the hospital, that guy who who checked, I remember even made a joke when he was like, when he was checking my stomach, and then he was like, I can see you have a community, and I thought maybe you said me have twins, and I was like, <laughs> What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're not saying I have twins, mm. and. Uh, He's, no, he's like, no, I, I meant actually the people who brought you in. Oh. And he was the, he was the first guy who gave me that, um, that cervix check. And I thought, this isn't that bad. And mm. I thought, because, you know, he was gentle. He, was, he prepared me mentally. And he was like, just relax. We can do this. Mm. So I thought, ah, this is not that bad. Mm. What have, I don't know what people have been saying. Till I got to the room. And there's this thing. Um, they started saying that we have to induce you. And I said, but why? Mm. I've, I've just been here three hours. Mm. And if I'm about two centimeters dilated, I don't see why or understand why you need to, to induce me. Yeah. Yet it should be something that has its natural course of, of doing it. Mm. And the first nurse that came in to give me the induction pill, that is one thing I will never forget. Out of everything, that was actually my whole birth story. The most traumatic thing was the, the checks mm. and being induced. Because, wow, a woman was rough. So did she explain why she's inducing you? Did you, you ask the question? I tried was to Was there ask. an answer? She just said the doc has said so. And I said, I don't feel, 
I don't feel that's a good enough reason mm. because I know what inducing does to women. And I kept on hearing these stories of people saying when they force, they induce you so that at some point it, you're not able to, to give birth and yeah. you have to go for C-section. Yeah. So that it becomes like a whole money thing. Mm. And I didn't understand why. So I was very adamant and I said, no, until the doctor actually came and mm. said, you know, I don't remember what he told me the reason was. But it made me look like as if your thumb is crazy. Re- yeah, you're refusing. Yes, and if you don't, if you don't do it now, it'll be your fault. Mm. So I just said, you know what? I want to get this over and done with. So let me just accept. The chick didn't even prepare me. She just <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't think that's the correct way. I really don't think. And she's almost treating me like some um some. Someone who has a mental problem. You get mm, what I mean? Mm. Like trying to hold me down, like just relax. Mm. And I felt, I know that's violated. Yeah, it felt so violated. In fact, I changed my perspective on a lot of things. <laughs> to a lot to be said on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, um, no, I don't think this is this is right. Mm. And by the time the next person was coming, as you said, not it shouldn't be everyone who's mm. just coming to check you. By the time the next person came. She's like, okay, I'm giving about till 10 a.m. I was like, 10 a.m. Mm. I need this baby out mm. now. So they took some time, and I thought what I was experiencing at that time was really bad. Mm. Till it hit like about 2 p.m. And I'm now feeling the proper contractions. Yeah. And I thought, hey, and this is when someone wants to come. And I think also they didn't have communication because someone comes to check now, and then 10 minutes later, I'm coming to check you. And I'm like, someone's just come from yeah. here. He's like, no, I have to check you because I have to give you what information to the doctor mm. and what. And I said, didn't you guys like have some coordination? Yeah. Because according to that hospital, it's only one floor for maternity. Meaning you guys are just dedicated for the people who are there. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think that was the case. So it felt like, in fact, there's a point I just refused. I said, by the way, you guys are not checking me. And yeah. I feel like I'll just follow my my gut. I'll mm. trust my intuition that tells me, now you need to, you know, to push. Yeah. Even by the time the child was coming out, like the final contraction, they told me not to try and push. Mm. And, I, and I thought to myself, and I was like, what do you mean? I feel, I really feel yeah. the urge now. Yeah. And the child wants to come. Yeah. And that is the moment the child came. Yeah. And I asked myself, what if I listened to her? Yeah. And I remember seeing... um. This is um, this lady's uh, YouTube story. I've forgotten her name. Who ended up getting fistula? Mm. That was the same thing that happened. They told her not to push, just hold it in, and look what what happened. Yeah. So I thought to myself, if I didn't trust myself, what would have happened? Where would I have ended up? Mm. And I mean, it's it's crazy. Fistula is a whole other story. Mm. And to that point. I just felt like those, um, even the understaffing in the medical field there was just, it was so evident because how people are running up and down to check other women who are giving birth. When you're crazy. giving birth. Yeah. Yeah. It felt crazy because it, 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 to me, I think it's something that should be, okay, I don't know, maybe I don't understand what the healthcare provision should be like, but I feel like that sort of setup, at least each room should have had two nurses or something mm, of the sort. Mm. Well, according to what I've seen, at least. But that didn't, to me, that's where the gaps were, the bigger gaps. And I think um, also, from what I know, the mortality rate of pregnant women is so high. high. When it comes, like the past two months at work, the three women who have died, out of uh, during the whole birth process mm. and it really opened up my eyes like after my own birth like how many things can go wrong mm. i mean walking out of birth with a child with a healthy child mm. and you are healthy, healthy yourself mm. yes it's such a blessing at this point and i i don't take it for granted yeah mm. yeah what what uh, as a f- so you know god willing <laughs> is another child what would you do differently in terms of your in terms of okay, let's say birth plan, hospital, asking for you know when you're there, what would you do differently? Yeah, okay, I have thought about it. Um, despite it being um, the despite feeling what I went through, I think I'd still stick to my 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 birth plan, my first birth plan, because to what my what my gut tells me 
that that feels like it was the right way mm. for me to have done it. You get what I mean? Mm. Um, the whole movement of the water calming your nerves and the whole binaural beats and everything. I think that's what I would do. And I think I'd even get a doula. I mean, to someone who outside the medical field is there to listen to you, mm. there to calm you, there to just make you feel like you're protected. I think that's what I'll definitely do. I think in terms of when we talk about impact of like the experience of that childbirth, <laughs> and I'm going to ask that question again, mm. like how did it impact you to want or not want the second child? Hmm, that's a very good question. How would I say this? Uh, first of all, the pain. I mean, I normally like to pride myself in, I, I can take any pain. Mm. <laughs> but uh, childbirth clearly, because it shows you if you if you know pain, mm. you don't know pain. Mm. Um, first of all, the pain. Also, um, looking at who you're having a child with, I think that's an important factor mm. and. You just, I mean, what it has taught me, just don't mess around. Mm. <laughs> don't, we used to take it for granted, you know? But I think those are major factors because the person you're with really, um, how do I say? It really helps you get through so many things that you take for granted. And it's it's not worth it to do it, to feel alone in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. So that's one way it has hugely impacted my life. Because I'll I'll make a choice, a much better choice next time. Mm. You just won't do things for the sake of doing it. You make sure you're being on the same page on such things. It's it's so important, and I think it's taken for granted mm. by so many young people, especially. I think it's those situations where you hear that your parent has told you, mm. don't, "Don't don't go and do these things," mm. and you take it for granted. But now is when you actually see. Yeah. They had a point. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of the major ways. Uh, I don't think I have any thing you change. I don't think I have anything I'll change. Yeah, because I I think I did have a good attitude despite the hormones, the hormonal imbalances and mm. the mood swings. I think I took it pretty well. I don't think I really had postpartum depression per se, mm. because once again, the support from family is was so immense mm. that I necessarily didn't feel alone. Mm. You get what I mean? Yeah. So I didn't necessarily have um, that postpartum depression. I mean, there are those days where yeah. you feel, you just cry. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. But from being tired. Yeah. <laughs> fatigued. And you feel like... Overwhelmed. Wow, this anxious. is a lot. Mm. And to think that women abroad do this without nannies... I mean, it's crazy. Mm. It's, it's 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 so crazy. So, yeah. But generally speaking, I think I turned out well. And not not saying it just to to feel like I'm a champ or I'm a better woman or mm. anything. I'll just say, luckily, it's friends and family. I yeah. mean, I now understand what, it, what when they say it takes a village. Yeah. This is exactly what it means. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a village. So tell me about the... So during that entire process mm. when we talk about expectations from society or family or cultural expectations did you feel like when you're speaking earlier about um, people from work g giving birth in different hospitals you have insurance um i like to remind i like to remind ourselves that we also have some privileges that other people don't have uh, we are talking about insurance mm. so do you feel like coming from a point of view of society's expectations of of you of your birth plan that you had to do things a certain way to be seen a certain way yeah i mean there's a um, i think there's some things i would say and people look at me like what the hell are you talking about do you mm. even know what you're saying you know like this is a kawaida thing mm. women just do this get it over and done with and you shouldn't be so special i mean it happens every day and those are things that you're even scared to talk about because you have to you have to watch who you're telling. You tell um some families, like I think people on the same level, maybe cousins, mm. sisters, you tell them, 
those who have children will be able to give you advice accordingly. Mm. Those who don't will just listen to me like, you know, you go girl, you yeah. do, do as you wish. Yeah. But if you're telling it to your moms and your aunties, some of them are like, hey, madam, you know what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> There's some certain things, uh, I don't remember what uh, what my aunties were telling me and it, didn't, it just didn't feel like that was right. You get what I mean? Mm. And I don't think, um, if I was to ever get pregnant again, I don't think I would share it with just everyone. Mm. I think I'd be one of those people who, either I gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because I don't want the, so many outside voices giving me what they feel I should be going through. Mm. Or what, um, what I should do for an effective birth, per se. Yeah. And by the way, that's when I, I truly respected my mom. My mom has always, always been a strict person <laughs> my whole life. Yeah. Even telling her I was pregnant was, I think that's the hardest, one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. But the day of my birth, I saw a different woman. Mm. I actually saw her empathy, her sympathy in her eyes. Mm. She was there. And I remember seeing her walking and I felt, Mom, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I yeah. felt like a child again. Yeah. I, I I cannot believe that's I mean I value her in a different way yeah. now. And uh but still she has the the those certain ideologies that she holds because of her experiences and because of what she went through. Mm. I mean she told me her story of her giving birth to me and I was like 30 hours of labor. Mm. And to hear that I came out halfway and went back in. What? <laughs> Please like, go back. What? Let's tell us that story. <laughs> what? I, I wasn't ready for the world, clearly. <laughs> How'd uh, you go out and come back in? So she had me when when she was about 40. Mm -hmm. And I think um I don't know what happens. You're still young. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happens when when it's a later when you're pregnant at a later stage in life. I think the the chances for more complications or something of the sort. So first of all, she didn't even know she was carrying me for about like four months. Till she felt out Sounds like a very familiar story <laughs> that we had. <laughs> and she went to get she went for a checkup and they're telling her by the congratulations. She's like, I thought I was just adding it, mm. you know. Mm. I don't understand how. But I think she took it gracefully. And now moving forward, I think she had to because her blood pressure was so high, mm. they had to now just induce her, I think 36 weeks or 35. Mm. Now she was in labor for 30 plus hours. And I think at some point, the nurse even told her, Kwani wo ujiku skuma. And I think she was like, what? You know, you're so disheartened. Mm. You're, you're tired. Mm. And someone telling you all this nonsense. And then her doctor came in at the right time. And he had to plunge me out because he, she, I, she pushed, she pushed. And I came out half one, I think, mm. back in. <laughs> Is that even a thing? I don't know. That even I was a thing. imagining the sounds. You know, there's, there's that water, yeah, everything. Yeah. And uh, he, he had to plunge me out. And I think I, I, I didn't even breathe for like the first five minutes, according mm. to her. So for her, that must have been way more traumatic. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the whole empathy she came with when I was giving birth. Because mm. I, I was, when, when did my labor start? At 2 a.m.? And yeah. I gave birth at 6.48 p.m. Yes. The next day. No, the same day. Oh, yes. The same, the same day. day. The same but day. But still, that's a, a huge amount of time. That's what, 19 hours? Mm. I think 19 hours, yeah. Ah, Just seeing her there was the best thing in the, in the world at that mm. time. Mm. Mm. And I imagine there's like th things we want to talk about in terms of what, what would you say? Because you're a first-time mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, you can't make recommendations no. as to what we should do better. But another first time mom is listening right now. And she's like, ah, I understand what that babe went through. Mm. So what would you say to someone who is going, is thinking, because they're, they're also looking, they're also trying to find, because I, I, until today, um, my friend Jerry gave birth the other day. Mm. She was still looking. She was still looking for recommendations of the best hospitals. At this day and age, we should have those resources somewhere where someone says, these are my real bona fide. Mm. 
non-paid experiences about this hospital so that I know. Mm. And our hospital maternity experience has become so medicalized that we are actually asking influencers to influence us on hospitals. Yeah. And not the actual experience of what you get there. So I feel like there's something that's not yeah, first of all I would I would I would not rely on influencers <laughs> again. <laughs> Yes, they might give us a glimpse of what is there to experience. First, wait. Mm-hmm. Explain to people who don't understand what these influencers influenced you on. Okay. I don't know if you can mention the hospital name. <laughs> but... No, but <laughs> maybe not. But like just how did we even get into the influencer influencer hospital Ness. Mm. Uh, algorithm. Mm. Now with these technologies, um, I think when you search one pregnant thing, now your phone decides. Mm. Every Everywhere you go, it's going to be giving birth um, information or yeah. pregnancy tips. So at that time, I happened to see this couple that happened to have chosen that hospital. Mm. And I think just either two weeks prior or two weeks after, another famous couple had also gone there to the executive suite to mm. give birth. And um, the first couple I saw had the whole live experience like everything, mm. the whole bath mm. bit. And I thought, hey, that first, that's very brave of you to have done that. Yeah, to have done that. That's a very invasive process. And then I, I thought, well, those guys are showing so much care. Mm. But now when I think about it, they had to do that for the show. <laughs> you get what I mean? They had to make sure that all those nurses, that all those doctors, because there are about three, four people mm. helping her. Meanwhile, in my birth, there was one person who was racing between out. another room. Mm. You know, such things. And that's the difference. They say uh, the, the birth process is a very thin line in sanity. Yeah? Mm. She, I think she went mad. Okay. <laughs> like jokes aside, yeah. she just entered my room and she had blood all over. Uh, she only had a hoodie and, yeah. the, you know, the, the maternity diapers that mm. you, you have to get. Those blood all over. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Mm. So that's when it hit me, probably what you saw. And I, I got a glimpse of what you've been trying to say, that you'd never yeah. do this again. Yeah. And I'm looking at this chick. And then she's asking me, where's the nurse? And, and I wondered, where would I know mm. where the nurse is? And in my room. Mm. And then she looks like she was shivering. She was shaking. And then now uh, she just said, call for me the nurse. Mm. And then she just ran back to her room. And I said, okay, let me just call the nurse real mm. quick. I beep. The nurse came to my room. I said, the lady next, I think, needs you. Mm. So she went and she came back. And she told me, if that lady comes here again, mfukuze. And I thought, what? Why? Mm. Why would I do that? Mm. And I think my mom came in after some time, and I had to go to the bathroom. And that lady came again, and she's crying. Mm. And I can't believe what, I'm not understanding what's going on, but I was in the bathroom, so I overheard her. Mm. And I think my mom called the nurse once again, and she went back. Now, fast forward to about midnight, she came again to my room mm. and asked me for food. And it's I thought, there's something, there's something, there's something, there's not, something right. not happening. Yeah. And I thought it was, so I, I don't remember what I had. I gave her Uji, I gave her, I think, Lucozed or something. Mm. And she drank it like someone who's been in the desert for mm. a long time. Mm. And, she, and I thought, this is, this is so bizarre. And then two nurses came and they took her. And then they say, this woman is crazy. She's just going knocking in people's rooms. She went to another uh, room where the husband was just there. Mm. And she's in the same state with the... Mm. With the, the so they're not cleaned her? That no, nothing? nothing. So I thought, I this is so strange. And later on, I came to learn that she was taken to like the, the psych ward. And she was alone. She had no family. Her partner wasn't there. And I'm thinking, what happens to the child? What happens to her? Yeah. I mean, and then you hear treating her like some high school student who is sneaking from room to room. Mm. I mean, she needs your attention. Mm. So now that's when I started feeling, okay, maybe this hospital wasn't the best choice. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because first, uh, I remember... After I'd given birth, I think I fainted <laughs> because I woke up in a different place from mm. where I was. Mm. And that's the first time I ever fainted in my life. And I thought, this is such a strange feeling. And I thought, hey, this is, um, 
okay, now things are not maybe adding up. I made a premature choice just because I was influenced to do this and all for the glam. And yeah, to to someone who would watch this and say, I think really take your time, not just to see what you're seeing on, on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. Yeah. Take the time and the best, I think the best uh, teacher is experience. So listen to to other women. <laughs> the elderly is. Is that what you're trying to say? The elderly is. <laughs> <laughs> listen to those. Some of them might just uh, say things for the sake of saying that's mm. true. You don't have to, I think, be a sieve. Listen to what everyone is telling you. Listen to the experiences and filter and see, does it align with what you imagine for mm. yourself? Mm. Because, wow, it's really important. It's really important choosing where you choose to give birth. Yeah. And not only give birth, but then also figure out what community looks like for you mm. in that space. Because then you might go to a hospital where they say you can't, we can't allow you to have yeah. anyone here. And like during COVID now. Yeah. And and I mean, but also just going back to that influencing thing, I I I hesitate to say this, but I'm wondering how many people are like you right now out there. Probably many. <laughs> Being influenced and what 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 kind of situation? Because yours was positive. Um, if anyone is watching and they would like to reach out to us and just tell us if their situation was not positive, mm. you know what what happened after that. And I thought I actually um, on that note, I thought I did my due diligence by I think I read each and every comment under those YouTube videos. Comments. <laughs> I went TikTok to the comments. generation. Yeah, what? I went to the comments and I said. These people will be objective mm. because, you know, friends and family sometimes might just try to steer you in the direction they want you to go. Yeah. So I thought this will be objective, guys, and say things for the sake of of, of um, the truth, Yani. Yeah. And th that specific hostel, I think, had the best comments out of all the hostels I went. I went to Facebook, I searched all from Avenue to, mm. to Nairobi Hospital to Nairobi West Hospital, all of them. And I thought, hmm, maybe the one with the most positive comments, you know, like when you're trying to buy something online, yeah. you'll obviously look through the comments. And I think, wow, well, this is where our generation has reached. Yes, this is where, <laughs> let me just say that out loud. When we're having intergenerational conversations, this is literally one of yes. them. Because yes. whatever you're saying, you cannot I cannot understand. imagine, I cannot understand. Giving birth is not buying something online. I know, I know. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have come to learn. but. Yeah, I, I really read through the comments and I thought, hmm, okay, mm. maybe this this will be the hospital I choose. And hey, I don't think it's it's really is it because now you come to realize via the internet, everyone just says whatever they feel like. Exactly, saying. exactly. You you just can't take something. I mean there's a good side to it, but there's also the bad side. People just say what they feel like saying at yeah. any one point. Yeah. How do you know it's, if they're being malicious? How do you know if they wanted something they didn't get? So now this is what I'm going to say. Yeah. Mm. So I have two questions before we close. One, if the doctor was here, what question would you ask her? The First of all, uh, the, the first question I'd ask her is, is inducing a normal thing to be done for? Because this, what I've read online from what should be happening and the effects of such things do hospitals really care for the health of the mother and child or do they just do it for the sake of it being a money-making scheme mm. you get what i mean mm. do what how would doctors advise us because from what i know i wanted a gynecology i mean a gynecologist from the beginning but i realized i kept on hearing stories that um ladies who had a certain or other mothers who had a certain gynecologist and when it came to the time of giving birth they took leave and went to travel <laughs> so you've built a relationship with that doctor yeah throughout your whole pregnancy for them to tell you i've handed you over to someone else yeah and then to add on i never knew that you having a gynecologist in your bathroom is another extra expense of mm. about 150k mm. for example mm. and i thought that's wild yeah Actually, that that's that's true. So the you will hear, and and again, if the doctor was here, I'm sure she'll share more information. 
Okay. So an obstetrician takes you through the delivery process and then basically does everything around your pregnancy and that. So you can have an OBGYN, mm. but you can have, you know, a gynecologist just alone. Mm. So the Dr. Mudoni works with one of the, uh, the, the actual, the person who delivered him. Mm. And he walked the journey with me from day of delivery to, you know, at some point I even got a complication and he held my hand and took me to the hospital. Like literally admitting me, making sure that I'm well. And on the day of delivery, he was there. And that's the kind of old school, I'd say, old school doctor that I expect. Mm. You know, working the journey. And I'm, I'm sure many doctors do the same thing. The second time around, I opted not to have an OBGYN. So I attended this hospital and I we would see the doctors on call. And on the day of delivery, midwives delivered me. And it was a very, very different experience for me. It was more of they were not hearing me. Mm. They were not listening to what I'm saying. But then at the same time, it's my second baby. I delivered the first one normally. You know, those are the questions they were mm. asking me. So, you put to talk on normal. Eh, normal delivery. Eh, now only second. Eh, so, to just expect me to just know. Just suddenly remember. Remember. Mm. And it was a 10-year gap. So, I, like for me, I felt like, you're not listening to me. You know, even the birth process itself, I kept on saying, the baby is coming. And the guy is like, ah, you were just six centimeters, like two, two, one hour ago, you, the baby can't be coming. Mm. But I'm like, I can feel the same thing you're saying. I feel it. The baby is coming. He's like, explain to me what you're feeling. And I'm like, bro, no, this is not how it works. Okay, when the baby's mm. coming, it's coming. So it was a very di different experience for me the second time around. But then I realized it's also because I have more knowledge. I have more understanding okay. of what it is that I went through the first time. And then I have more, you do the more don'ts. autonomy over my own body. Mm -hmm. And I can say these things out loud because I also understand. Do you so, feel like that came with age as well? I feel like it came with, with age, but then it also came with my body knowing what it did the first time. I don't know if that makes sense. It went so back to memory. It went back to memory. And I'm like, and the doctor said to my husband, this one gave birth very quickly. So you might, you might also have the same, the same thing. Mm. He literally said, so that was playing in my mind as the guy is telling me, how do you think you're feeling? And I'm like, the baby's coming. So listen understand, hear, feel, but also communicate. The thing that I feel like they don't do very well is that they don't listen. Mm. I know you're the expert, but I'm trying to communicate something that's going on inside me. Please listen and understand. Mm. And understand. Mm. So I also feel like the thing that <laughs> you've raised quite well is that I have an understanding of what I want. You with this new... <laughs> I was very green. New I had no uh, expectation. To yeah, have. the way you consume information is different from mine. So I think maybe it's time for your generation to explain to people, this is the kind of information I want, and this is how I want it. Mm. How do we? How do? How do you? How would you explain to the doctor? Literally, you know, I need to know this information. And I think it also boils down to, as you had asked from conception what kind of doctors should we see i mean now we have uh, if you search online that's when you see things like mary stops now over those mm. mary stops are not just known for other businesses yeah <laughs> <laughs> they are they offer such services but you know you don't you don't know the quality you don't know if you'll be treated like just another girl who's gotten pregnant mm. or another lady mm. who's gotten pregnant and i think there's also a lack of information on how to go about that. Because mm, mm. it's just, go to this doctor, go and get this test done, go and get this scans done, go and get this done. Then you don't know if it's for the sake of doing it or it's actually what's meant to happen. And then you find yourself paying an arm and a leg for consultation visits, just to be told, let's hear the baby's heartbeat. How are you feeling? Mm. Any symptoms? Okay, come, this other date. Yeah. And like, I just paid almost three Gs. How does it just go like that? Do we have affordable, um, affordable, uh, what, how would I say? Yeah, maternity care. Like, yeah, uh, maternity uh, care. Prenatal. Pre prenatal, yes. That's actually prenatal, postnatal. Hmm. Yes, that's exactly what I was looking for. So 
do we have those options who can guide especially young moms or let me say first time moms to those who don't have the privilege of of um, using insurance mm. to go for such mm. um, visits where will they go or mm. will they make wise choices accordingly we don't i don't think we have that at all mm. for sure and it's a huge gap so us at our mothering the woman <laughs> I'm plugging myself. We are trying to create those resources and put them up on our website. But I don't think we are doing, we can do better, is what I'm saying. Like, by us having this conversation and mm. someone else listening, they will be able to say, oh, okay, that's the kind of information that I want. I'm hoping people like Marie Stops, people like who are in the reproductive health space can also come and partner with us to see if we can reach some of these first time moms with this information it would be mm. brilliant for us to reach more orders via tiktok where you're consuming your content and figure out you know um cuz it's how we're figuring out life exactly, right now exactly exactly mm. and then also do these <laughs> influencers who influence this this hospitals oh, come with disclaimers <laughs> those are the questions yeah. we should be asking mm. Actually, uh, to the question you asked me, how does my birth change my, any part of my life? It's how I viewed influencers. Mm. Because now I came to realize many of them, okay, fine, it's their job. But rarely do many of them um, do these things uh, for the sake of resonating with that particular hospital or brand, mm. if I may quote it that mm. way. For the sake of, I liked this service and this is what I will share. And I think the world should see this as opposed to, hey, we can choose this hospital for this. How much do they pass to Kizauko? Mm. Such things, they don't give you, they don't tell you the truth. They're mm. just making their money. So I'd also say, take it with a pinch of salt. Don't just listen to, don't just consume it. I mean, this is our generation now. We just, we consume all we see on the media. Yeah. Don't just take it in and think what happened to them would definitely happen to you because to them, we're just another patient. Mm. Them, it's someone who is going to market. You know, there's a difference in sales and marketing <laughs> and the Vituka ground. Mm. Vituka ground need different. Very different. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'll definitely say, say that. And I don't know if this will be my second question to the, to the doctor or mm. if it's a point. But uh, the topic about doulas and that whole team. Mm. From what I've seen and heard, I feel like they provide a more natural experience for for mothers who are who are expecting mothers, mm. those who are just about to give birth, the whole process. I feel like um, doctors ridicule them a lot because mm. if you bring that up during a doctor's visit, they'll just laugh it off and be like, you seriously want to go that route? Mm. And the mothers who I know have gone that route have had such good experiences with with birth. I mean, there's this thing now of not cutting the umbilical cord immediately. Mm. You know, that whole that whole thing. I feel like um we should have that aspect as well. Because if hospitals are not that genuine enough to care for you, mm. Rokosafi, then I'm sure there's a certain group of people who are willing to do that. But what we don't know is the safe the safety. The safety of it. Yes. Yeah. It, which is what which is literally the the doctor mm. saying or the medical field basically saying the reason why you want us to have children in hospitals is because it's a safer, cleaner environment. And there's a more higher chance of you not, you know, um risk high your the mortality rate of both you and your child is less in a hospital. Mm. That's what they always say. But you know that aspect of a doula also comes in is this person walking the journey with you. Every single time you feel like, ah, I have a this ache, I have a that ache, you you don't have that 3,000 bob to go for a consultation for someone to say, mm. oh, it's just indigestion. This doula literally works. She's like a, your sister or your mother, mm. holding you and respecting you and feeling you, walking, walking with you on that journey. Mm. And that's why people, you know, talk about, you know, respectful maternity. Like, how do you feel when you're actually in that process where someone understands and says, mm. okay, I understand. And this is me speaking from, you know, the doctor that worked with me, the journey. And he would sit and he would listen and he would say, okay, 
I understand. And he wouldn't treat me as just another statistics mm. statistic. He was a, he's a very popular doctor, actually. He's Dr. Modoni, the one who was supposed to come uh, partner. And he was, he's a very respective, respectful, um, respected doctor in his field. Mm. And he would not treat me like another statistic. I, I'm sure that day he might have seen 10 women, but he would make you feel like you are his first. And, you, you know, he'd be like, okay, you've sat, you've talked to him, now sit here. Let me check you. And you feel, you know, and there's always that thing that will come up in your whatever. Mm. And he'll remind you, you're not eating well, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And that's the thing that you're, that you're missing, you know, in that respecting. The personal touch. Exactly. So once you go and you've just had your baby and guys are like, yeah, you're fine. You can go home tomorrow. Mm. That's not how it works. So, so thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your story with us. Thank you for hosting. Um, I'm hoping that it wasn't, I didn't bring back traumatic memories. Oh, no, you didn't. But I'm sure you've helped a couple of people who are going to be watching this. And just in case they want to reach out, and uh, would you be willing to? Yeah, sure. Why not? If it could help. Um, it's crazy, actually. <laughs> I never posted my pregnancy online mm. until um, during my baby shower, one of my friends posted me on her story mm. and she tagged me and I said, okay, yes, the fine. secret is out. <laughs> I might as well. And the moment I reposted that story, the number of women that who are my friends had reached out, oh, you're also pregnant. Mm. And I thought, wow, okay. I, I now built a small community mm. from them. So we've been sharing our progress since. And it's crazy how... Um, now after they reached out, we can now have the questions. It's like our mini forum mm. of of things we can get to find out, things they never tell you during pregnancy. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a TikTok that that no. um <laughs> <laughs> no seriously, on a serious note, there's this TikTok that that scrolls when someone says something they've gone through in pregnancy mm. and then now it's like uh a stage. No. Mm. Okay. I don't think it's a stage. Okay, you get the gift. Mm. So they say this is reason 308 where I should never get pregnant. Mm. So there are those things that they never tell you and you get so shocked. Like like a prolapsed uterus. Do you know your uterus can fall out of your vagina? So I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what like is literally this? literally how a prolapsed uterus. Yes. And that's, that's what we got to share through, I don't know, that's the positive side of social media, mm, I guess. Mm. So yeah, we built like a mini mini group of moms. So That's now it. we're asking if anyone who is watching and feels like they connected with Rhoda, connected with us, and you want to know more about her story and connect with her in her mini community, <laughs> please feel free. Join our group. Our Join WhatsApp our group. group. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? See TikTok channel. <laughs> no, we don't have TikTok groups, but once they, once they have that uh, update, uh, we're live. <laughs> done. <laughs> okay. So it's our, thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, yeah. That's the end of our little thing. It's a wrap.